Warner Transportation Museum and Brandon Thompson, director of the Gorgas House Museum. And I see we have a guest with us today. Catherine, would you like to introduce him? Yes, that would be, I would be honored to. Um, yeah, joining us today is um, Ian Crawford. Um, Ian is an instructor of interior design in the University of Alabama's Department of Clothing, Textiles, and Design. His interests include historic preservation, restoration, and education. And um, Ian and I have actually known each other for a number of years. We worked together at the Preservation Society um, here in Tuscaloosa. And um, have have been in touch ever since and he's uh, he's absolutely fantastic and i'm thrilled that uh, that he was able to join us ian thank you so much well it's a pleasure to be here <laughs> well before we get started i just want to remind everybody that uh while we're broadcasting on facebook and youtube uh which if uh, you if you want to watch on facebook you can find us on the mildred westervelt warner transportation museum's facebook page and you can also watch from the gorgas house museum's facebook page or if you prefer YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash UA Museums and watch it over there. But uh, while we're broadcasting on Facebook and YouTube, feel free to ask any of our panelists any questions you might have. Just drop them in the comment section. And remember, this is live, so anything can happen. So just hang in there with us in case we have any connection issues. Uh, but now that we've gotten that out of the way, how did we get started this morning? Well, I know from personal experience, Ian has no difficulty carrying on a conversation. Um, so maybe just uh, maybe just diving right in. Um, Ian, can you tell us a little bit about your background and um, how you came to teach at the university? Uh, well, I, I uh, went to school at the University of Alabama and um, uh, I graduated during uh, what we thought was the a recession, um, and uh, and at that time, as you all know, you go to graduate school, <laughs> and um, I went to Tulane School of Architecture to get a master's in studies, and um, while I was there, um, furthered my interest in design and decorative arts, uh, but really sank my teeth into um, the the subject matter, and I've always loved material culture and the built environment, and uh, when I came back. Uh, I started uh, working in preservation in Tuscaloosa, and uh, I was just absolutely delighted uh, to be asked to teach adjunct for the university. And after several years of that, I switched over to full time at the university, and I'm really enjoying it. Fantastic! And through um, and I happen to remember. I won't ask you to um, specify what year you graduated from Tulane, but I seem to remember that the year you graduated, your dissertation won the top. It was selected as the top dissertation of that that year. Am I am I correct in that? Oh, go on, Catherine. You you uh, <laughs> are you embarrassing me? Yes, I, I, I um, my thesis was on Tuscaloosa's uh, decorative arts and architecture uh, from eighteen sixteen to eighteen sixty one, and um, uh, I I did not know I was going to win an award, and it was one of those funny things where I was sitting in the audience at graduation. And they started talking about this award for most outstanding thesis. And I thought, well, I didn't even know they had that award. And then they called my name and I continued to sit there because I wasn't really paying attention <laughs> that, uh, that that was me. <laughs> Well, in um, in which I, again, I was um, as as your friend, I was very proud when I I heard that um, that you had received uh, received that accolade. That is that is really fantastic because um, out of is it was overall throughout all the the all the theses that were presented, um, not just for your department. It was every every thesis that had been presented, which is even more outstanding. So I, I think that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but along those lines, so what are some of your research topics and what draws you to those kinds of topics? Well, um, I really like daily life. Um, and I, I, I'm fascinated to learn uh, what people were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We have monuments and we have epic things and battles and, and treaties that are signed in history. But what was the daily life of what were the things that led people up to that? And um, so one of the things I really enjoy going through are people's letters, uh, diaries, and, um, and newspapers. Um, you know, historians are the ultimate voyeurs. They're always looking in on other people, but uh, not engaging with the subject. Uh, or not engaging with with the people, and um, you know sometimes we'll spend so much time with somebody, and you you might even relate to them or talk about them 
you know, to, in today's world, and people say, oh, how do you know her? I say, oh, no, I don't know her. She's been dead 100 years. I was just uh, <laughs> going through their things. But you, you do sometimes find that you really do have a understanding and connection with people. But I'm, I'm so fascinated by everyday objects of what it take, took to, to run everyday life. Um, and in today's world where we document so much of what's going on with, with pictures and social media, even still, we don't often um, document true everyday life of, you know, people post the, the cutest picture of their baby. They don't post the picture of the tantrum. And that is, you know, part of, uh, part of life. And I'll relate that to literature that the, the paragons of, of, of literature, one of the things that makes them so wonderful is often they do delve into everyday life. Um, they may have epic tones and, and themes going through, uh, but Jane Austen and War and Peace um, and, and uh, Charles Dickens novels, often they go into the nitty gritty and the daily dirty, as well as overarching themes. And so I think what brings history to life and, um, uh, and what I'm so interested in researching is those everyday objects and everyday stories uh, to bring the current built environment from what we understand to life. Yeah, and I think what you've touched on is when you look at, say, letters or diaries from the 19th century, as we do for the Gorgas House, um, is that it provides like a powerful, authentic window to like into these people's lives. And if you're going to relay that to like modern interpretations of how we present ourselves, it's not as curated. I think a lot of times with like our social media efforts and how we present ourselves is a very curated, very specific image of how we want people to perceive us and how we want to perceive ourselves. When we actually start reading these diaries and these letters and they're romantic and Victorian prose, uh, it's it's flowery, but there is like a the that is the human essence uh, that we're really interested in, and it's it is a a fun and fantastic uh, journey to read all these things. Um, so, uh, so you know, Catherine and I we work with students all the time in our spaces as employees and visitors and researchers, and we've had the opportunity to teach uh, on occasion. So how do you approach teaching and what are some of the experiences you've had as an instructor here at the, the university? Well, uh, my personal, uh, if, if, if I have my own school of thought, um, the, the motto is learn by doing. And um, I think it is so important for people to experience either by proxy or or in real life um, aspects of what they're trying to understand I'm a big proponent of if you're going to do a job um, do all levels of it not necessarily that you're going to be a bricklayer but you should understand how the bricks are laid so that you understand what that person's going through and what should be happening even if that's not your job at the end I enjoy people understanding all the different components um, so when I teach, I try to take a very holistic approach and not just jump straight to, you will be doing X. I say, you will be doing X, but you should be aware of Y and Z. I'm in fact, A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, everything <laughs> uh, leading up to it as well. And um, I think that I, 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 I struggle with uh, students sometimes um, in trying to relate to them because you're thinking about your early education uh, preschool, kindergarten, that sort of thing. Every day's lesson starts with imagine you're this, imagine you're a pilgrim, imagine you're such and such. And we do that a lot of that with the um, museum um, uh, tours. You know, imagine that you're going through this. Well, then you spend the rest of your education being told not to imagine. You're spent the rest of the time saying, no, settle down and learn this and do this and spit this back out. And so often it's a big break to try to jump back into, let's get back to imagining how might it feel to live in this environment? How might it feel to eat these things at such and such a time? How would that um, affect you? And when, when we start to bridge that division again, people really do connect. And I think that um, it really always will take imagination and storytelling for people to connect to uh, what they're learning. And without that, it really does end up being regurgitated information and, um, you know, as you go through museums and um, uh, Catherine's Museum and the Gorgas House are, are wonderful examples of there are places you should experience. Uh, 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 they're, they're powerful settings. And the way that they're currently set up, people get to be in the space and walk through and, and the things that you're supposed to touch, you can touch and things you experience. Uh, and that's really powerful. You create a memory there. And I've been to fabulous settings that were not necessarily great museums because you walked through as if you were on an airport conveyor belt. Mm 
Yeah, the, um, um, <laughs> here we go. I was just going to say yeah. the, the, that environment does, um, does make a difference in how you experience that environment. Um, definitely, uh, definitely impacts the, the memory, the, um, the entire experience. And I, I think it's absolutely fantastic that you um, present that approach to your students and um, encourage them to, to think more, more creatively and um, in their projects. And um, even though they, they do have something relatively tactile that they can present at the end of it, they, they have a better understanding of, you know, why they're, why they're, um, redesigning a, a space or, you know, things like that. And that's, um, again, just background knowledge from previous conversations you and I've had. Um, so I think, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And, um, I, yeah, I just, I think that's wonderful and good for you. Uh, yeah, I love the the idea of imagination because we do we do exist in these historic spaces and we interact with them all the time. And part of the power that we're able to do at these historic spaces is evoke that imagination, that creativity, and allow people to make meaning in these spaces however they wish to. And I'm probably going to steal the idea of imagine for my next tour that I give, uh, whether it be digitally or in person. Um, but yeah, Ian, if you're okay with it, I'm definitely going to steal that concept and actually use that the next time after you have to talk Absolutely. to people come in. All right, so thank you. And I'm going to reference you every time um, and send them your way after <laughs> I talk to you. Uh, so what kind of advice would you give for students who have similar research topics as yours? What, what kind of advice would you give them? I think that um, uh, they should uh, jump into the time period in a much more visceral way than I think a lot of people end up doing. Um, history doesn't have a beginning and end point, uh, but historians pick a beginning and end point because we have to, to tell a story. Um, and so if you want to talk about uh, the Battle of Borondino and the Russian War of 1812, you're going to choose at such and such a time, this is going to be the setup to lead up to that. And at such and such a time, this is the result. But that's not what it was like for the people going through it. Um, and so one of the things I, I advise people to do is if you're trying to understand a place or a um, uh, so you want to learn about um, Amelia Gale Gorgas. Um, so yes, you can read this about her and this about her. Well, let's also read about um, the towns that she was in, what was happening in those towns, what was available as amusement, what were her neighbors like? And uh, often the more you get saturated into a, a, a place and a mindset, you realize, oh, wow, there was a lot going on or there's a different sense of pace for things. And um, so many things change so rapidly. Um, uh, six months ago, we would all be sitting in one of these, um, you know, we wouldn't be doing the live stream because we'd be at each other's museums in, in person. And, um, you know, the world's a very different place. But um, sometimes people say, oh, well, so-and-so was from Greensboro, Alabama. Well, that's not much of a town, so they can't have, you know, had that much going on in, in the 1850s. But then you go there and you say, oh, wait, what was happening here? This was a, you know, a, a resort town, a major um, a social place, so maybe there's more to it than I've used given to understand. Uh, when you read newspapers, uh, this is going back to what I said earlier about inundating yourself in the daily life, uh, one of the things I think that is, is so fun is that it'll contradict a lot of your, uh, a lot of the students' ideas of uh, what, whatever time period it was. One of the favorite things that I came across, um, a, in the 1850s, a woman in Marion, Alabama was attacked um, she's the daughter of a wealthy um, uh, store owner. So we, we imagine her, she's this uh, well-to-do woman. She's got her gown on and she's strolling through town. And, you know, we've got this gone with the wind mindset of, of what she looked like and what she might be doing. In the newspaper article, she fights off her assailant with her knife. Well, that gives us to understand that when she was walking, she had a knife with her, um, which is kind of a different mindset <laughs> uh, than what you generally expect for this um, 1850s, 20 year old lady to be, you know, walking through the streets of Marion, Alabama. And you start to say, wow, well that, you know, makes me think a little bit more. Um, and we're, we're often given the movie set for a time and a space and we start our research there, but I try to break it down and say, don't, don't set anything up in your head, build it entirely yourself, go back to those source materials and build it from there. Because if you start on someone else's idea, then you're going to be, doing the sequel to their movie. You're going to be, you know, building on that set. And um, I think that um, bringing it to 
today and what's very, very currently going on in the world, people are going to start saying, we better go back to original source material to write history books. We better go start going to original things rather than just giving the 77th edition of a book written in 1922. Um, and, um, you know, just where, where right now, a lot of history books look like um, heavily edited texts. They just keep editing and adding things rather than rewriting the story and saying, well, you know, let's take a holistic new look at this. And so I encourage students when they do their research um, to yes, read the read the biographies of the person you're writing, but all, or writing about, but also read the biographies of their en enemies at the time. You want to learn about James Knox Polk? Read about Henry Clay. Um, the person who loves Henry Clay is going to write some things about Hen uh, James Polk that's not going to be seen in James Polk's biography. And all these aspects that 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 you put together, where on surface value, someone might say, "Why are you reading about Henry Clay?" If you're writing a paper on Polk, well, now you need to see all sides of the story. Yeah, trying to instill uh, examining history critically uh, is a great ambition, a great goal, because who does this textbook, who does this narrative benefit, and who is it kind of detracting from? And that, that, that's fantastic. Uh, there's so many subtleties and nuances there. And that's one thing that makes history so fun and interesting, is that you have all these different points, uh, different points of view that have actually created it and we're consuming the way it's been presented to us. But when you go back to the original source material, and as you say, in this, in this instance, you get a much richer and fulfilling experience of what history was actually like. Uh, yeah, and it's fantastic. So, so, so much, much, much fun. All right. Um, so do you have something you want to share with us? Do you have a presentation before we kind of move on? Because we want to talk about a little bit yeah. more about your, your history and your experiences. Um, I'm going to um, go to um, share screen, uh, or I'd like to put a couple of slides up. Um, let me know if they're they're up there. Yep, looks good. Yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, so you know, I'm 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 very interested in preservation advocacy, and um, one of the things that that is in many ways unfortunate about preservation advocacy is that it's called preservation. Uh, so I want to run through a couple of terms real quick. Preservation is pretty rare. Preservation is keeping something exactly the way that it is. And um, on the view screen, um, I've got Drayton Hall in South Carolina. This is a wonderful example of true preservation. Drayton Hall has been kept in its original state. They don't repaint. They maintain the original paint. They don't mm. do new furniture. They don't change things. They keep it exactly the way that it is. That's a pretty rare uh, case. Most of what we call historic preservation is historic conservation, keeping together the built environment while not necessarily keeping it in exact certain way. Uh, I've got a picture of the beautiful staircase at Drayton Hall, particularly to illustrate the point. When you tour Drayton Hall for six months out of the year, people go up one side of the stairs and down the other side. And then six months, they switch it back over and you go down the side. People have been coming up and vice versa, so that the wear patterns will remain the same. That's the level of uh, expertise they're, they're going into this, this aspect of preservation. Um, this slide is um, a 1930s image of uh, the Jemison Van de Graaff mansion, um, which we can, we can sort of joke and say, in this example, we're seeing preservation by neglect. Um, the house is its original finish and a lot of its original features on it because no one had, at this point had been able to uh, really re redo very much of it. Um, you can see wisteria growing across the front. Um, but with the Jemison Mansion, um, it's a wonderful case study for historic conservation because it was remodeled as a residence. So here it is um, during the Birchfield years when it was used as the Birchfield residence and they, they remodeled it. They put a new kitchen in, they moved rooms around, they moved walls around, they added plumbing, electricity, they did all sorts of different things. They, they redesigned the gardens, um, they painted the house. Um, and and so, so this is a remodel of a historic house. Um, during the years that it was the library, it was rehabilitated into a library. And uh, so it's not the original purpose, it's not the original colors or anything like that. And so it was restored. And so a lot of what we see is restoration um, and versus preservation. Restoration brings it back to a time period. And um, the Jemison Mansion is an incredible case where the house was brought back to 1862, including the uh, faux finish on the stonework, um, the carpet patterns, the faux graining inside. Um, an enormous amount of time and energy went into this. But I want to point out, 
everything does not have to be restored back to such and such a time. Um, and you can have fun with this. As we know, the Gorgas House um, is a wonderful case study of preservation and restoration. Some spaces were preserved the way they were, and some spaces were restored back to a certain time period, but the house as a whole is not one set time. Uh, rehabilitation is probably what people see most often, um, but do not realize it as being part of historic conservation. And um, this is a view of Temerson Square in Tuscaloosa. Um, a few years, uh, not too long ago, really, uh, Temerson Square was slated the entire thing for demolition because it was a blighted area. There was no conceivable use. Um, this is in the city, city planners uh, documents from the time. No conceivable use of this area. Um, and as we know now, it's one of the most vibrant sections of Tuscaloosa's downtown. Um, the elevated sidewalk was where loading trucks would back up to and, and deliver into the warehouses there. And now it's where there are stores and restaurants and bars. Um, and so people might not think of that as historic preservation. Well, it's not technically preservation, but it is rehabilitation and keeping the built environment um, still working. One of the things that we come across constantly in preservation uh, are these three quotes. Uh, Catherine, have you ever heard any of these? You know, I, I, I try to block those conversations from my memory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yes, unfortunately, these are three statements that, um, that are, are made a lot. And um, uh, particularly the second one, someone should do something. I received that a lot at the Preservation Society and the person telling me that someone should do something, they wanted that someone to be the society. And right, um, right. yes, so uh, yes, very, um, yes, very, very common conversation points <laughs> in, uh, in this. Yeah. Beep, beep. And, and, and my response to uh, so much of Often they say you can't save them all is the justification for why they need to tear down something or re something or change something. And I say, we already haven't. We've already lost most of it. So much of the built environment um, in this country and particularly in the Deep South um, as, as, has been destroyed. And so the argument you can't save them all, we already haven't. So that's why we should fight as hard as we can to save what remains. Someone should do something um, is the um, uh, equivalent for uh, those who have children, when they say, who did, you know, who spilled this? Not me. Um, you know, <laughs> did. Um, uh, someone should do something. Yes, you, you're, your community. You want something changed. You have to be the agent uh, that gets something done. Whether that means you write a letter, whether that means you um, volunteer someday, whether it means you join an organization that can do something. Um, someone should do something. That someone is you. And um, often in preservation, when we'll say, red flag, red alert, this is in danger. The people who could do something about it say, oh, they wouldn't let that happen. Um, that, that wouldn't be torn down, that, that couldn't happen. Um, but of course it, 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 it does. Uh, one of the number one comebacks uh, for people in, in outside of the preservation world is they say, oh, you can't do that. That's on the National Register of Historic Places. And um, on this slide, I have a National Register plaque and I have a old hotel um, register. A register is a list and um, you can be put on the list. And when you're torn down, like the Loyola Library, you can be taken off the list. Here's a building on a campus of historic register properties and it was demolished and taken off the list. The National Register and, and State Register are listings it is all about local support and local organizations that actually uh, preserve and have the, uh, the, the power to take care of things. Um, I, I went to school in, to, in New Orleans at Tulane and uh, one of the case studies and one of the things I, I, that we learned there that I always like to share with people because it's a pretty, pretty universal idea that even if you haven't been to New Orleans, you get the general idea of, of what the French <laughs> is like. And, um, to tell the story when people say they wouldn't let that happen. Um, all through the 60s, there were signs like this in uh, the Vieux-Curé, the, the uh, French Quarter, stop the elevated riverfront expressway. Now, what was that? That was a plan to do um, a raised interstate straight through the French Quarter following the curve of the river. So this would be standing at Jackson Square, looking towards the river. This was a um, mock-up of what the, what the interstate would look like. And people said, oh, I don't know, that, that's, that, I, I think that, 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 that's not good. 
And so the um, highway department came back and they said, okay, okay, we'll make it blend in. We'll do arches on it. That'll, that'll blend it in more with the historic architecture. So here you see an arched elevated expressway and um, people were so excited. They talked about how it would revolutionize New Orleans. It would bring million of pe millions of people through the French Quarter, which is a very small area. It's very congested. Millions of people at 60 miles per hour would be able to see St. Louis Cathedral, the Cabildo, and Jackson Square. Well, it took a lot, a lot, a lot of hard work and organizing um, to stop this um, Riverfront Expressway. And this is a, um, a wonderful... Uh, uh, handout that was is given out in the 60s. Um, uh, and as you see this, this, this monster reaching across all the, uh, the monuments and areas through, um, uh, through New Orleans. And um, this, this was a, a, a plan to, um, or this was an attack on the plan to build the elevated expressway. They had already constructed, the, it had begun um, constructing the expressway and um, it was stopped and it was moved somewhere else. This is Claiborne Avenue. Um, in 1967, um, and this is Claiborne Avenue just a few years later, and uh, talk about a change of environment from the live oak trees uh, to, to an ele elevated expressway. So it did move out of the quarter, but it moved somewhere else into the Treme area. And um, uh, so I, I, I like to share the story because when people say that wouldn't happen, well, it, 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 it can and it does. Um, let's see if I'm back to, uh, am I back with y'all on screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and that's one of the difficult things in the world of preservation that if you lose a battle, people have no idea how hard you tried to fight to save, for example, the Circe house. Catherine and I were on the front lines of trying to save that structure, um, pledged tons of money, did all sorts of things. Our organization was working tirelessly for, for, for over a year on that. And, um, but then when it was torn down, people just said, well, they should have done something. Uh, yet, when you do an incredible feat like saving the Jemison Mansion, uh, like saving the um, uh, Battle Freeman House, saving the old tavern, people say, oh, that was never really in danger. Um, so in preservation, you have this double-edged sword. You're not rewarded for your successes because people realize what went into it, and uh, but you, your, your failures are remembered, um, which is a, 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 a sort of a frustrating thing. But um, uh, so much of... of uh, what we what we what we struggle with this is about um, uh, the challenges and there's burnout, funding, all sorts of different things. A lot of this is the same thing that deals with museums. Um, people say, "Oh, the museum should be able to do that." Well, then who's going to support that at the museum? Um, isn't it your job to such and such? Well, it is, but there's only one of me. So this is what we're 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 trying to do, um, and uh, so it, it it is an ongoing struggle. And I think one of the key things to try to do in education is try to get people to connect to it more and try to get uh, civic leaders and education leaders to understand how important the built environment is, how important museums are, um, so that we can learn and connect to this. Yeah, yeah, that was a really interesting presentation. I found myself uh, back in school, basically, and uh, I was getting a really good, really good lesson. So that, that was a lot of fun. And I go to New Orleans all the time, having family down there, and wasn't aware of that. And like you said, I, I just didn't know that would never happen. Uh, you look at it now, and you just can't imagine. Yeah, you just can't imagine that happening in that space now. Just, you just can't. Oh, and, and of course, if if that had if that had happened, there would not be a French Quarter. People would not be staying. The buildings would have fallen into disrepair. It would have disappeared like so many other American cities that did. And uh, you take Tuscaloosa as a case study. People are constantly frustrated about what's going on on Lurley and Wallace. Um, but that cut right through the center of the city. And um, think about how many people believe that the city, the downtown ends at Lurley and Wallace. And um, we, I've had students from Tuscaloosa who had heard of Capitol Park or something like that, but had never crossed Queen City. They, they'd say, well, that, done that, isn't that where University Boulevard ends? Um, I mean, they never crossed uh, Lurling Walls <laughs> to see, you know, the, the history that's there. Um, and so, so much of, of, of this and uh, uh, there's so much of the built environment that changes. Um, and and we, it, it's our job to help address that and help people understand it better. Yeah, I might go ahead and skip down to a uh, question further down the list because it kind of ties in to the current conversation we're having. And it's like, so what is the role of historic spaces in your work? And more, 
more on topic to this to this percent to this uh, to this conversation is how do we get people to start changing the meaning that they give these spaces how do they actually start seeing uh, the worth and the value in these spaces how do we do that i think i think it, it some of it goes back to um asking people to approach um uh, history with 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 some of that imagination again. Um, sometimes people say, "I don't like this space because this is what it represents." Uh, they say that may be what you believe it represents, or that may be what it represents to you. And I'd like to hear more about that. And I'd like you to meet some people who this space represents something else. Um, so if if we take the Gorgas House, um, uh, we can say. Um, I don't like where that because I don't uh, think that students should be dining on campus. And I looked up that it's a dining hall, but no, it it, it was, it isn't anymore. Um, probably won't be again. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's a, a facet of its history. Well, I don't like that house because it's where um, faculty members lived on campus, and I don't think that's appropriate to, for them to be living next to the students. Well, it was, it isn't anymore. Probably won't be again. Um, but it's a faster the story of the university. Well, I don't like that. It's because it's where a Confederate general once lived. It was it is a home, it, and there's there's more to it. There's so much more, and these spaces, uh, no matter what their purpose is now, they're they're chapter books. Uh, does everybody like every chapter of every Harry Potter book? There's some of them that that are really difficult. Well, you got to get through that because the bigger story is coming along. Um, uh, is everybody's favorite chapter of Old Yeller the end? No. Um, and um, so, so how are we going to deal with this? And we are the ones experiencing the story to eliminate a structure, uh, uh, to, to, to tear down the Gorgas house because we don't like what it represents. Um, well, now that's the end of the story entirely and we can't address it at all anymore. Um, and to give a new life to a structure, um, uh, as a case with the Westerville Transportation Museum, Westerville Warner Transportation Museum is is incredible because um, you know nobody comes in in their bathing suit, do they, Catherine? Well, maybe they do. I, um, uh, no, we haven't had that yet. No. Uh, um, but but you know, someone coming. Well, I thought this was the old pool house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. And now there's a new chapter to it. And now there's a new story being told. And please come in, and we invite you to take part in that. Um, so I I, I, you know, I want people to experience these spaces. Uh, one of the things that um, I've worked uh, on both in, in professionally in preservation and then as a personal project is restoring um, a, a slave dwelling where enslaved people lived and worked. And a lot of people will ask about that. They say, why would you want to hold on to an aspect of slavery? But one of the things that I want to point out is you are yourself when you're at home. I want people to, to you know, all of our listeners and so forth, think about uh, uh, at home is where you're laying on the sofa, watching your stories, eating Doritos in your elastic pants. You know, this, this is, the home is where you are your true self. Well, um, the enslaved people who built the, the, the decadence of the 19th century, we don't have very much of their lives to know about, but the few places that they resided that are still standing, that's a place where we can learn about them. And it is so important that we do. These are their homes. You cannot imagine their lives without being in these spaces. It is a very powerful thing when we take a tour of say, Magnolia Grove um, house, you go through this magnificent house, beautiful things, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And you go outside and you go into um, uh, the original kitchen and the slave quarters and you see where the enslaved people lived and worked. And you say eight people lived in this room uh, to support the lives of the two people who lived in the whole house. You have to see in both spaces. And then you say, ah, even if I didn't like either of those aspects, I now know why we need these spaces to help envision. Um, in uh, the Transportation Museum, I know there's a couple of things you can lift and put down and see what the, the weight of something was. Um, and uh, anybody who goes camping knows how to conserve resources. If you have to go down to the river to get the bucket of water to bring back up, you know how careful you're going to be with that water. Um, and uh, uh, so anytime that I, I say, I want you to understand this space, understand a historic setting, then um, say, all right, well, there's no air conditioning. So the heat that it is outside is the temperature inside. Um, and they say, oh, I wouldn't be able to stand that. Oh, you would. Uh, air conditioning is um, uh, and, and And people just need to understand, um, well, what, what would it be like? And I think connecting that to the multiple actions of what individual people 
And in the deep South for um, the very wealthy, a lot of the people supporting that would of course be the enslaved individuals. What it took for them to run households, what it took for them to build the wealth, to buy beautiful things, to travel and, and do these, these, these aspects. And I am always remember, I always think back to um, a, a, a quote um, from the uh, Marquis de Lafayette when he was on his uh, 25th anniversary tour of the um, United, oh, I'm sorry, it was the 50th anniversary tour of, of after the um, American Revolution. Um, he came through, that doesn't sound right, 50th? It was in 1824, whenever it was, uh, uh, which, which anniversary it was, the Marquis de Lafayette came back and he said, what's, um, what's happening here, what's going on? And um, he was in Washington, D.C., and they are building additions to the state ca- to the national capital, and enslaved workers are up on the scaffolding doing that. And he and his attendants said, I don't understand how you can talk about democracy and liberty and all these things when you have these enslaved people, um, they're working. And um, Henry Clay, who's giving the tour, said, that is just the scaffolding. It will come down when the nation is done. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing because Mar- uh, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette's uh, aide said, who will take down the scaffolding? And I think that what we're discovering through American history and, and relating this back to, to slavery, because it's so in key with everything we deal with at the 19th century, um, it's still being taken down. And people still need to understand what went into uh, the decadence and wealth that it took to build the United States, to, to, to build um, the houses that are often museums and all these different settings and a whole story there to be told. And I think that it's a, a, a really amazing story. And I'm excited to see what, what, what people today are really going to dive into that and, um, and look into and understand. But it will take the built environment and it will take historians and museums um, being, uh, they don't necessarily, are, aren't necessarily going to lead the charge because they're the ones who've been steadily leading the charge for quite some time. And then there'll be a big movement to push how we address these things. And um, so it's an exciting moment right now to see uh, what's going to happen with that. Um, but it is, it's so much about getting people, um, to address their space, understand it. And, um, uh, often, uh, so often people who are decision makers are sitting in historic spaces, whether they realize that or not. And they're creating history when they do that. And the same group of individuals who sits in the historic, um, Tuscaloosa city hall saying, well, you know, there's just no way to save historic structures. So we're going to rezone all this so it can become a parking lot. Well, they're sitting in a building that was once slated to become a parking lot. We're, um, so, so it's so important to have a more visceral connection and, um, and to look at the world with fresh eyes from time to time. Often we see everything we're doing as B-roll footage, just what we're used to. Um, but it is, the world is so incredible and there's so many amazing things and so unique. And that's why, again, you can't save them all. Well, we should try everything we can uh, to save the special things that we can. Yeah. Um- Sharon e. Green um, in the history department um, addresses some of those um, exact themes. And um, oh, one of the classes she teaches is the 19th century environment. Yeah. And yeah. she takes her students through a walk through downtown Tuscaloosa. And um, they, they, many of them, as um, she and I have conversed, uh, many of them after that tour, when they've when they've read a little bit more about what Tuscaloosa was like in that time period, things like that, and the fact that we still do have a lot of buildings um, in downtown that are now restaurant shops, you know, whatnot, they, as, um, you know, just uh, coming through and going through downtown, they recognize these buildings as, oh, yeah, that's, that's Five Bar, or that's Chuck's Fish, or that's, you know, what, uh, the shirt shop, you know, what have you. Um, but then whenever they they look at it through um, after having that perspective, then it's this building has been here so much longer and has uh, been part of this environment much longer than I even could fathom and, and realize. And, you know, they they really kind of uh, take take on a different perspective. So things things like that are are definitely definitely happening through a variety of, of departments and um um, you know, Hillary Green's Hallowed Grounds tour is another perfect example of that. And, um, you know, any anyone that uh, that hasn't experienced that really, really, really should. Um, students, students, community um, alike. It, uh, it it's definitely something that um, that needs to be needs to be done. And um, and again, it's just um, you know creating a a more holistic approach to our own history. And um, that's 
that's how we move forward. Um, but along, kind of along those lines, um, you spent uh, quite a bit of time at the Jemison Van de Graaff Mansion. I know you know quite a lot about that building. So, um, what can you, what do you, what do you want to, I guess, expound upon your time specifically at that particular historic structure that we are very fortunate to still have on um, in in town on Greensboro Avenue. Yes, the, um, um, when I when I graduated from Tulane, uh, I was extremely lucky that uh, one of my favorite houses um, and and one of the first things I saw when I visited Tuscaloosa uh, as as in high school to visit my sister who's in school at Alabama, and um, I stopped over at the Jemison Mansion. I was just enthralled with it. How can you not be? Um, so I, I a position was available, and um, so I I went to work there, and it was. Um, really amazing because so much work had been done before me, but there was a lot of work left to do. The house had had its original restoration, um, but it was it was mostly empty. There, there, there was a couple of case pieces around the perimeter of the rooms and, and a couple of odds and ends uh, throughout the house, but um, it was very much being treated like a wedding venue that happened to be in an old house rather than a, a beautiful historic house museum that you can have uh, events in. And um, the... Uh, uh, just it, it, a, a amazing amount of detail and work that that, that is is part of that house um, is a, a, a case study of the 19th century's ingenuity in engineering and design. Um, when I was at Tulane, I uh, took part in an internship where I worked at the P. Todd House Museum, and um, we worked with Louisiana Landmarks, um, uh, who, who ran the house, and school groups would come through and they would draw uh, little vignettes. They draw little areas of the house. And the one thing that all the uh, drawings had in common was the most prominent thing that the, that the children had in their drawings was do not touch. There was the do not touch sign somewhere very prominently um, in, in their little sketches. And it made me think about where does the do not touch stop? Does it stop in someone's head? Does it stop with actually not touching things? Um, and uh, uh, and I said, if I ever run a house museum, as much as possible, I want people to be able to engage um, and where possible and appropriate touch uh, and, and really take part and, and, and be um, involved with this. So I started the Jemison Mansion and I started putting reproduction furniture in that people could actually sit down on. And um, so that you could go into a room and say, please sit down and experience this space. And I'll never forget um, two board members came in and they were absolutely livid that I had made some changes. They were, they were just livid. Um, and uh, during dur during their, their discussion about how upset they were about the changes, they got so tired they had to sit down on the furniture that uh, had now been put in the house. And when they sat down, I said, oh, I've never noticed this about this room. And then they started talking about how charming and wonderful this room of a house that they had overseen for decades and had not actually experienced yet. And... Um, you know, I, I want to say, this is what I want to do for everybody. I want, you already love this house. I want more people to love this house. You love this house and hadn't experienced it, which just shows how amazing the house is. So I, 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 I strove during my time at the Jemison Mansion to make it as interactive as possible for people to go through. Um, there's beautiful house museums that are better restored. There's larger houses. There's houses with better furniture collections. Sometimes people come in and they say, oh, such and such museum has better painting. Oh, such and such has better furniture. Well, we're just showing you what was available in, in the times in Tuscaloosa, and we're bringing a lot of people in to say, this is uh, the lifestyle of a 19th century um, uh, Alabama congressperson. So they come through and they learn about that. And if you're able to sit down, if you're able to take part in something, and even though the event aspect of, of the uh, house would stress me out because there's so many people there, in many ways, it was so wonderful that so many people got to come in and experience the house. The house has been visited by thousands and thousands of people. And whether they got the historic tour or not, they took part in something that a lot of museums aren't able to give. Um, they were able to party in a house that was built for entertaining. And um, whether they realized that they were actually having a little bit of a lesson right then and there, what is it like to dance in a room uh, with um, ornate gilt wallpaper under a um, six light gasolier? What is it like to have dinner and laugh and see someone you love marry someone that they love, we hope. Um, uh, it was it like to take part in, in, in the joys and sorrows of life um, in this environment. So sometimes people who don't think they're interested in historic conservation 
are very much involved with it, whether they realize they've actually made that connection or not. Uh, the work that you did to um, in in that uh, really the main the main floor of the the Jimson Mansion was um, it, it really was a a different space when when you were when you were done with it and um, eventually the uh, preservation society offices were moved into the basement and so for a little bit of a break I would leave my office and I would go upstairs and. Um, you know, sit sit in a chair that wasn't my office chair. Look at an environment and a uh, you know a space that was not across from my desk. You know things like that. And it was it it was a very very comfortable space. It um it felt it felt like you were supposed to be in there versus. Um, you know, if you sat down, oh, maybe sitting on the, the edge or corner of a sofa, because really you kind of felt like, oh, I really, really actually shouldn't be here. He said it's OK, but I still kind of feel about, you know, sitting on this and some, you know, some some places were like that. But um, that was never, um, you know, that was never a feeling that I, I personally felt with the, the Jemison Mansion because it did suddenly feel like. Oh, this is this is how it works as a house. This is how this this is how it works in in this capacity and um and that was that was absolutely fantastic and i personally loved um whenever you would set up the dining room with all the different um all your different place settings um it was uh, something that we we would do for the tuscaloosa bells to show them what a formal place setting looked like and because ian has such a fantastic personal collection of um a variety of different serving pieces there not only we we very cleverly figured out how to have history um in in that etiquette lesson really um so it was um his which how many how many of the presidential um oh, the uh, presidential um place settings how many of those do you have uh, uh, a number between one and another number um <laughs> Good enough. Uh, but, and, and then, uh, as Ian was going through and showing, this is where your salad plate goes. This is where this fork goes. At the time, you would have had this little fork. And while we don't necessarily use this anymore, it, you know, at one point, this was a utensil that people had an entire set of, you know, for, uh, you know, the time period. Um, but there was also that little bit of history and, you know, what people ate, what the, um, you know, what which president's um, uh, China was, you know, on on display, that kind of thing, and it um, it, it was that that was always one of my, my favorite days because it um, it made it made the dining room become uh, a living space, and it just uh, and I again spent many 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 uh, lunch board meetings at that space, and I looked forward to the day that you would put all your place settings out because it stopped being the boardroom then, and then became a dining room and um, right. a, a very grand dining room, you know, at that. So uh, that was always one of my, that, that was always one of my personal, personal favorites. Um, and, uh, and uh, changing the, changing the way the house is, you know, seen and how it's, um, how it's perceived. And it was only by putting out a couple of objects and again, objects, objects help create that space and help create that environment. And um, so, yeah, I really, that was, that was one of my, my personal, personal favorites. Um, so I guess if, if you were, let's just look at your time at the Jemison Mansion, I think, um, because again, you have such a, such a wide variety within your, um, you know, still budding career. But if you were to go back and, you know, do your time at the Jemison Mansion over again, um, what would you do differently? What do you What do you think you might you might alter if you could go back and do it again? You know, I I, I to to reflect on that. Um, sometimes, and this is going to sound sort of strange. I'm I'm in general laid back, and um, I like to hear what other people have to say and so forth. I think if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have been a lot more direct. And I would have screamed and shouted a little bit more. Um, I've learned since then, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I've learned that um, no matter how much you care and love about something, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone else does too. And you should share that passion with others. Um, and, but there's going to be some roadblocks and some people will not share that passion. And wouldn't it be sad if a one-term council person destroyed everybody's passion for it because they didn't have it, so they voted against something. 
And um, so I think I would have been a lot more direct. I would have called people on their on their actions. Um, and uh, I think that 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 may be in part from uh, living in a in a coronavirus world where we say, "Why wait? Uh, what are you holding on to that bottle of wine for? What are you waiting to 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 do this, that, and the other for?" My whole life, people have told me to wait and do something later. Well, now's not the best time. Now's not the most appropriate time. You should do that party later on. You should go on that trip later. We may not be able to have that party anymore. We may not be able to go on that trip. We may not be able to do these things. We may not be able to save that structure if we don't do this now. And um, so I think that um, if I can look back and say what I would have changed differently, it's what I would recommend people start looking and how they live their lives now. Um, you know, be a little bit more direct and, and figure out what you want to do and go for it. I, I, in my students, sometimes people think it's a little bit uh, rude, but I've asked students before if they really want to continue in the field. And people are so shocked when I say that, but normally it's because I've identified that the student isn't happy. And they've, now that they're at such and such a level of the program, I say, do you want to keep doing this? If you haven't enjoyed their first four classes in this program, you might not like the next eight classes and you might not like the career you're heading into. So if it seems to me to say, do you want to keep doing this? I'm doing you a bigger favor than most people will, uh, 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 would do and say, maybe it's time to do look at something that, that does have the passion. Constantly we run into people say, oh yeah, I did such and such in school, worked for a year in it, hated it, and now I do this. Um, and um, we, 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 it's sort of unfortunate that people don't get to have a little bit more experience in things before they dive right into something. Um, I was always passionate about preservation and design, so I was lucky that I'd found that and kept going with it. Um, but I think that um, all fields should sort of have a little bit more uh, of a time to address and say, is this what you want to do? Maybe you like this, but you're passionate about that. Let's help you do the thing you're most passionate about. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, we, I know we're getting, we're getting close to our time, but um, we, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't bring this up because your, your background is absolutely fantastic. And I just happen to know that is your personal home. And so not only is preservation and um, restoration and everything that you've, um, you've done a big part of your professional life, it's also a big part of your personal life. And so just, just briefly, because again, I, I think we could, um, we could talk an entire another hour about your, uh, your current um, home project in Greensboro, but could, um, could you just uh, briefly um, talk about, uh, talk about what you've, what you've done at, um, at your home in Greensboro? Sure, sure. And if 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 uh, uh, Rebecca will help me with this, um, I'll throw up my uh, slides again. Um, um, let's get to. Oop, there we go. Um, uh, or, am I on the view screen? You sure? Are. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the presentation's uh, there. Yeah. Um, uh, so so um, in. Uh, 2015, I went, or in 2011, I went to an estate sale at this house, the Oaks in Greensboro, Alabama, and um, fell in love with it then. And in 2015, it was actually still for sale. And uh, long story short, I took a leap of faith and and jumped in and um, uh, moved into the house, um, sold my house in Tuscaloosa. And um, it has been really amazing to, uh, as they say, put your money where your mouth is or, or whatever the saying, um, to actually live in in a preservation project. Um, I've really enjoyed working on the structure, um, exploring and, and spending time in the grounds. Um, this is a little gravel garden and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this to, to point out um, the house was over, overgrown and the yard was overgrown. And um, rather than, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, let me just clear everything out. Um, this, is, this is a great metaphor for how I like to do the research and how I like to go through things. Um, I carved out negative space from the existing plants of the trash plants, of the, of the plants worth getting rid of. And, and the negative space that developed, I paved with gravel. And it became this beautiful wandering path through mature camellias and azaleas and Japanese magnolias, all these different trees that have been struggling amongst the kudzu and the nandina and the hills and privet. All these things were growing up through it. And um, so when you start to call out the bad, but spend time to nurture the good, you're going to have a beautiful garden. And, um, you know, at the, the end of um, Voltaire's famous um, philosophical book, Candide, uh, they ask the philosopher, uh, what are you supposed to do in life? And he says, tend your garden. And um, so tend the garden of your minds, tend the garden of um, 
of, of, of your spaces um, in, um, in, in life and uh, do the best that you can with that because uh, it's your chance to have an impact and to be part of the story, the ongoing story that's constantly being written about the built environment in these spaces. Um, so it certainly has been a pleasure to work on and be hands-on restoring a house like this and to have fun with it. Um, they had fun with it in the 19th century and I'm going to have fun with it now. And um, uh, we're able to party again. I'm able to come down and <laughs> um, uh, spend, spend time in the, in the, in the not museum house. <laughs> Sorted, done deal. I'm there. Um, I'd, I've enjoyed following, um, following you on Instagram and, uh, you know, watching the things that you do on, uh, in your garden and your pond and, you know, things like that. And, um, it's, it, it's just always, it's just always great to catch up with you. And, uh, again, you're, and any, anytime I have a question about, is the, you know, an antique or anything. And I, I definitely, definitely will be in touch and say, is this something that's, is this something that is worth this or is it something that's just a trinket? And because I know, you know, and um, so every, I know you, you've just got such a, a, such a wealth of wealth of knowledge and um, just uh, very, just, you're, you're always such a, so much fun to talk to because you're so interesting. And um, I, I hate that we don't get to hang out as much as we, uh, we used to, but, um, but yeah, as soon as, as soon as all the, the COVID is, manageable and you can throw one of your infamous house parties i if if i'm lucky enough to be invited i'm there so you just let me know the date and the time well uh I, well thank you so much for having me it's been a real pleasure yeah hey, no, this I, has been a lot of fun i think uh i think uh house parties and tending your garden is a great way to go out that was a a good ending note um so we really appreciate you ian for uh coming on and, and sharing your your experience uh, with everything. And, uh, I, I personally, I, I need to get out to the Jemison mansion. I've, I've heard everybody talk about it, but I've never visited. So uh, I'll have to go see it one day, one of these days. Uh, so that gives me a lot of inspiration as well. All right. Well, I Wonderful. think that's, that's, uh, going to wrap it up for this museums from your home live stream. Uh, we've changed our live stream schedule a little bit, uh, because we've got some big events, uh, happening this summer, uh, like Bama bug fest, which just, uh, started yesterday. So Bama bug fest is going on the web. So if you appreciate good puns, like I do, uh, that's a great one. Uh, so we'll be doing uh, virtual programming, um, from, uh, the Mildred Westervelt Warner transportation museum, as well as the Alabama museum of natural history's Facebook pages. Um, you can also find all of that content. Uh, I've got something down here at youtube.com slash UA museum. So if you uh, prefer to watch on YouTube, you can do it uh, there as well. Um, Catherine, uh, before we wrap up, do you want to say anything about Bama Bug Fest? Um, just, uh, yeah, the, uh, the preservation, uh, goodness gracious, we've been talking about preservation. Um, the transportation <laughs> museum is involved again this year, but one thing that I do want to stress to everyone is all of the content for Bama Bug Fest is all online. There is not anything happening at the transportation museum this year due to the coronavirus like we have had in years past. Um, but please everybody, um, check in at, uh, bamabugfest.org. Um, all the content is fantastic that, has been put together um, but please please know that no activities for Bama Bug Fest are taking place at the Transportation Museum this year all content is online yeah and you'll find all that content at bamabugfest.org and the Transportation Museum actually put together a really cool uh, online exhibit uh, called Details Unseen the, I think it's called the Hidden Secrets of Bugs uh, it's yes. about a, a photography class at the University of Alabama that took some uh, macro, macro photography using photo stacking techniques to get really cool images of of uh, different kinds of bugs. So definitely stay tuned for that and visit the uh, Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum as well. Uh, 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 Transportation Museum uh, website is what I wanna say. <laughs> visit the website page as well as bamabugfest.org uh, and you'll be able to, to find that exhibit. It's gonna be really, really cool. Okay, well, I think we've gotten all that uh, uh, said and out of the way, so I just wanna, uh, 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 remind everybody that if you'd like to support UA Museums and anything that we're doing here, uh, you can become a supporting member by going to give.ua.edu slash museums. That's a great way to uh, help support what the museums do. And uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for us. So thank you again to Ian for uh, spending some time with us today. Thank you for Brandon and Catherine for uh, chatting uh, as well. And I uh, wanted to thank everybody for watching and visiting UA Museums from your home. All right, we'll have a 
happy Wednesday, everybody. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you. Of course.